I'm going to move on to the case of Jacqueline McDonald. Uh, can we please look at poll 00113278, please? Thank you very much. We're, we're back again to the Court of Appeal. Um, I'd like to look at, it's paragraph 179. I don't have the page number, unfortunately. Scroll up a little bit more. Um, Jacqueline McDonald, on the 8th of November 2010 in the Crown Court at Preston, Jacqueline McDonald pleaded guilty to theft. Uh, she had pleaded guilty on the 5th of July 2010 to six counts of false accounting. On the 21st of January 2011, she was sentenced to a total term of imprisonment of 18 months. Confiscation order was made. As a result of the proceedings against her, Mrs. MacDonald was forced to file for bankruptcy. Uh, an audit of her post office had revealed a shortage of £94,000. In interview, she said that she had experienced problems with Horizon, and when she contacted the helpline, she received no assistance. She denied theft, but accepted she had unintentionally made false accounts. Mrs. McC and this, I guess, relies on the predication that um, signing off the accounts each week rather than was kind of verifying their accuracy versus acknowledging that's what Horizon uh, says should have gone through the system. McDonald's, McDonald's defence statement made reference to problems <coughs> experienced with Horizon. The defence made a number of disclosure requests, but the prosecution made no disclosure in respect of any Horizon reliability difficulties. Mrs. MacDonald had made 216 calls to the National Business Support Centre about transaction and balancing problems. The pre-sentence report recorded her as saying that she had not stolen the money, but admitted to accepting the system balances as correct in order to roll over into the next trading period. And that seems to have been a requirement, as we have heard from other sub-postmasters, they literally couldn't open and continue trading and therefore had no chance of making up any shortfalls or indeed living and surviving by making any money at all unless they signed them off. But then signing them off was taken, at least on the post office's side, seemingly to mean that actually the balance is correct rather than an acknowledgement, simple acknowledgement that this is just what Horizon says, even though we're making lots of calls actually to the helpline saying it's not. If we scroll down, I'll read the, the bottom half of paragraph 182 and then into 183. Um, nevertheless, as the post office concedes, this was a Horizon case. The prosecution case was dependent on data generated by Horizon, and yet there is nothing to indicate that any uh, Fujitsu audit data was obtained at the time of the criminal proceedings. Uh, there was no evidence to corroborate the Horizon evidence. Issues raised by Mrs. McDonald were not investigated. There was no proof of an actual loss as opposed to a Horizon generated shortage. Uh, post office concedes that her prosecution was unfair, but we conclude that the prosecution was an affront to justice. And we're seeing a bit of a pattern here with the different cases. Not only are the prosecutions unfair, but the judges are also saying in this case that they are an affront to justice. And that's even despite some people clearly have, you know, making guilty pleas, as in this case. I mean, I guess if you can, I mean... It, it'd be an impossible position to be put in, wouldn't it? Do you plead not guilty and fight a battle that you're struggling to afford, that you can't get hold of the proof required because the proof required has to come through the people prosecuting you? Yes, that should be made in disclosure. We know several people now who've said that hasn't happened. You know, what a situation to put a human being in. I'd like to look at her interview. That's can be found at UKGI 00014889. Uh, in this case, you were the interviewing officer. Are we to assume that the person who comes first is, is the main interviewer? Yes. Yes, so you're assisted there by a colleague, Suzanne Winter. <laughs> Suzanne Winter, we have also heard from previously in the post office inquiry as well. as a few videos up from her testimony um, earlier on. Were you the officer in charge of the investigation of Miss McDonald? Yes. Yes. Uh, were you the disclosure officer in her case as well? <coughs> the, the, all papers that I would have would have been disclosed to our criminal law team. We would then in turn disclose it to the defence. I'm not asking about the quality of the disclosure, no, no, I, but in I, terms I, I of your just, role, I think you I, signed um, I, I, schedules of material 
purporting to be a disclosure officer? Yes, I think we take the role as disclosure officer as well. There's not an independent person. Thank you. Um, if we please could turn to page five. I mean, that was uh, quite a roundabout way of just saying yes, I think. I'm going to read to you a section of her interview transcript. It begins... I'm going to begin with you, who says you've just admitted that you falsified your balance because you inputted figures to enable you to balance. She says, yes. You say, do you know that's a criminal offence? She says, no, I didn't. Uh, and then there's a summary. It says that you stated the accounts had possibly been falsified from either November or March. Um, you produced some sheets and asked her to state who had written the figures on the sheets. Uh, she said that some were hers and some were her colleagues and some were just her colleagues. Uh, you asked if she had any time off. She said she had two days off in June. Her colleague was away in May. And then it says um, that you discussed the last sheet starting 27th of September, um, and she confirmed it was her writing. You asked her to explain what the figures are. Uh, she stated the figures were what was in the safe, in the roller, cash, and the tills. Uh, she also stated that they were wrong and not worth the paper it was written on. It says, SB asked uh, where she would have got the figure of 65,000. She said it would have been from the balance from the computer. And then it stops summarizing and goes into the actual words spoken. It says, would you like to tell me what happened to the money? She says, I don't know where the money is, I've told you. And you say, you've told me a pack of lies. She says, no, I haven't told you a pack of lies because I haven't stolen a penny. Again, concentrating on words used in an interview, pack of lies um, sounds somewhat like language you might see in a 1970s television detective show. Uh, was pack of lies something that you, you would say to defendants? That's the same terminology that sort of come out. It, it, it's, a, it's a pace interview and, and it's, not, it's not a nice interview. Normally before any in, interview, the majority of times I speak to people and say to them, you know, it's not personal, the questions have to be asked. The kid, you won't like the questions. I mean, I guess it's one thing saying the questions have to be asked. I guess they could be asked with care and in a certain way, particularly at a time that's uh, obviously stressful for the person being interviewed under caution. That's what it is. It, it is a criminal, it's a criminal interview in accordance with PACE. You have no difficulty with using those words. It, it, it went through. It went through the court system afterwards, and not, nothing was picked up by a by a defence team to say that it was oppressive or aggressive. So, because the defendants' representatives didn't say that it was oppressive, you still you think that it is therefore appropriate language to use in an interview. As I say, it's a difficult interview. Um, so I guess, you know, I guess it does depend on perception whether something's aggressive or not. Maybe, as I think he said previously, um, it looks better or worse on paper than it did in real life, although it's hard to, hard to um, envisage how it would come across politely or nicely to the person on the other side, particularly if they are telling the truth.